Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for the third and final installment in this series during which we have thoroughly discussed the case of Natalia Barnett, a Ukrainian orphan who was accused by her adopted parents of being a full-grown sociopath who wanted to poison them and throw them into electric fences. Today we're going to wrap this up because I'm going to show you in more proof that Natalia was truly a child when Michael and Christine Barnett had her age legally changed to 22 and then they abandoned her in an apartment and left the country. But before we dive into that, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Incogni. Privacy is very important to me because a lot of my life is out there on the internet, but I want to make sure that there isn't too much of my life out there on the internet because I want to protect myself and my family. Every day, thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and trading your personal data without you knowing anything about it. And I'm not just talking about your full name or your email address or even your phone numbers. I'm talking social security numbers, your address, IP information, employment history, even your shopping habits. And it's really scary to think about what some someone could do if they have nefarious intentions with all of that information. And if these companies are only selling your data, that's the least of what they could be doing with it. I don't want to give anyone that kind of access to me or that kind of power to mess with my life, my livelihood, my family. And I don't even get me started on what happens if any of those companies have a data breach and then your information is in the hands of somebody even more nefarious. For instance, uh, PayPal is just the latest company to report a massive data breach. And when these things happen, you don't even find Find out about them until the company notifies you and by then all your information including credit card numbers, banking info, social security numbers, they're all up for sale on the dark web. You have the right to request data brokers to delete whatever information they have about you and to protect your privacy. The bad news is though, it would take you so long to do it manually, literally years. But that's where Incogni comes in. Incogni can do all of that long, messy work for you automatically. Incogni helps you protect your privacy and take your personal data off the market by reaching out to these data brokers on your behalf and requesting that your personal data be removed. And they also deal with any objections that anyone might have. I've had issues in the past with identity theft. Someone once opened multiple lines of credit in my name and it took literally years to fix everything. It's been an actual nightmare. It's still not completely um, solved and cleaned up. And I don't ever want to go through that again. I don't ever want anyone to go through that again, which is why I use Incogni myself. Incogni is even great for smaller issues. Like um, when I Google something for a case, let's say I'm Googling something about weapons or something. And then all of a sudden I'll see ads popping up for like gun shows and stuff. Um, things that I don't really want to be getting ads for. So Incogni really helps you with little things like that too, that are just minor inconveniences, as well as you know, bigger things that are major issues. The Incogni setup process is super easy. You just sign up with your email address and then a number will pop up on the screen and that shows you how many data brokers Incogni has on their list ready to be contacted, which I love because it's a real number. It's something tangible and it makes me feel like, you know, something's already being done and I'm one step closer to being safe on the internet. I love that Incogni is easy to use, streamlined. There isn't a bunch of clutter on their interface. It tells me what I need to know. It tells me what I need to do and then I can move on with my day. And then as time goes on, Incogni keeps you updated on what's happening. For instance, for me, after a few weeks, I was notified that I think nine or nine or 10 data brokers had already deleted my data. And then I was able to clearly see that on the Incogni dashboard. I definitely think you should be trying Incogni out for yourself because everyone can benefit from this service. And right now, the first 100 people to click the link in the description box below and to use the code Stephanie Harlow, they are going to get 60% off at Incogni. Start getting your private information wiped from the internet now by clicking the link below or going to incogni.com slash Stephanie Harlow. Use code Stephanie Harlow for 60% off at Incogni. Thank you so much to Incogni for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. As I stated at the end of the last installment, after one year at the Westfield, Indiana apartment, Natalia's lease was up and the apartment complex chose to not offer her a renewal due to the issues that she'd been causing the other pearl-clutching tenants who should be hanging their heads in shame as we speak. Are you hanging them in shame? I hope so. 
Do you feel the shame? You better. In July of 2013, after the Westfield apartment didn't work out, the Barnetts moved Natalia to another apartment located at 914 North 11th Street in Lafayette, Indiana, which is in Tippecanoe County and in a completely different county from where the Barnetts lived and about an hour drive away from where the Barnetts were living at that time. Now, this was not the best part of town, although Michael Barnett claims he would have felt perfectly safe and happy to just casually stroll around the streets of this neighborhood. During the series, uh, the Investigation Discovery series, Michael Barnett says, quote, It's a nice part of town. This apartment is within two blocks of an adult GED center that she signed up for to get her GED. It's within two blocks of the bus route, a suicide prevention center, the Salvation Army, a local grocery store that takes her food stamp card. You couldn't draw a map and centralize her better to a place that could care for any one of her possible needs. End quote. And and it's funny because the makers of this docuseries did Michael dirty because as he's saying how nice and safe the area is, they put in B-roll over his voice showing the neighborhood that Natalia would have been living in. And it's clearly not like the best part of town. It's very run down. There's trash in the streets. There's graffiti everywhere. And it's not like the artistic kind of graffiti. It's just clearly not a nice area. And to think that Natalia would have been around 9 or 10 at this time and living in this place alone, it's just a very, very sobering, scary, and sad thought. And one of Natalia's neighbors in this neighborhood was a woman named Kira Weaver, and she was interviewed for the docu-series, and she said she was born and raised in Lafayette, and even she knew that this area where she lived in was not safe anymore. We lived a block away from a village pantry, and there was vagrants uh, outside of that place, and there was a homeless shelter. There's a lot of crime happening. And at any point, someone could have gotten her to go home with them or could have just straight up picked her up and snatched her. Definitely not an area of town that I would let my kids walk around unattended. It's gotten to the point where not only do I carry a weapon in my home on my body, I carry a weapon outside of my home on my body at all times. It's a necessity to be armed. But the neighborhood aside, the apartment itself was basically a death trap for someone like Natalia, who was not only a child at this time, but who also faced challenges due to her disability. If you remember, Natalia had a rare form of dwarfism and diastrophic dysplasia, which affected her cartilage formation and led to malformation of her bones and her neck, spine, ankles, pelvis, knees, arms, and hands. Her condition also affected her ability to grip things with her hands because she couldn't use certain fingers, and due to the contractures throughout her body, she could not completely straighten her legs, so her knees were always flexed and bent. Medical records from between 2008 and 2018 show that Natalia walked on her tiptoes due to these contractures, and she also overcompensated to one side of her body because of the malformation of her pelvis, which means she's not going to be super stable on her feet because she's walking on her tiptoes, so she doesn't have the benefit of the balance of her whole foot, which is why we have, you know, feet that way. It's the best for balance. And she's going to, you know, sort of lean to one side because of this pelvis malformation. And so that's also going to throw her off balance. Natalia also had a club foot, which is a genetic defect that causes the joints in the feet to dislocate from the joints in the ankle and then turn inward like a golf clubs. So I guess the question is, whether or not Natalia was an adult or a child, could she have safely lived by herself and functioned properly without help in that Lafayette apartment? And spoiler alert, the answer is... No, absolutely not. It wasn't safe for her in any way, shape, or form. In 2019, Indiana State Police Detective Brandon Davenport, who's a rock star, by the way, we're going to talk about him, but he's a rock star, he took a video of the apartment that Natalia had been living in, which was basically the top floor or the top unit of a converted house. So they took a house and they turned it into probably four apartments. Now, in order for Natalia to have gotten to her upstairs apartment, she would have needed to climb a set of five stairs from the street to the yard. And then she would have had to have climbed a set of six stairs from the yard to the door on the side of the house, and then an additional 12 stairs to the second floor apartment in this house. Now, the bathroom of this apartment had one of those old-fashioned kind of clawfoot tubs, and the kitchen had an electric stove top, but the controls were situated at the back of the stove, 
making it impossible for Natalia to reach the controls of the stove without burning herself, or I mean, at all. Like She'd probably have to crawl on top of the stove to turn it on. Clinical geneticist Dr. Brad Tinkle said that Natalia would have had great difficulty getting in and out of that clawfoot bathtub, and she may have been able to use a stool to get into the bathtub, but that would still be problematic due to the tiptoe position that her feet were in because of the contractures and the club foot, and also the fact that everything would be slippery and wet, which bathtubs are when you're bathing. Like, a clawfoot bathtub, because it has a very high side, is hard for anyone to get into. Like, I have to brace myself and hold on and really use a lot of balance and dexterity when getting in and out of one of those things. It's very dangerous. Now, neighbors of Natalia would later say that they could smell her from 10 feet away, which is most likely an indication that she was not regularly or thoroughly bathing because it was either impossible for her or very difficult and dangerous. And most likely, because the washer and dryer were also very high, she wouldn't have been, you know, doing laundry that often either. The stove in the kitchen, as we talked about, would be impossible, basically, for Natalia to use. And uh, Dr. Tinkle said, quote, even with a stool, she would have been leaning on top of the burners to handle the controls, end quote. Natalia would have needed to use a gripper to get food in and out of the microwave or the dishwasher or things off of the countertops. And this gripper required grip strength and shoulder mobility, neither of which Natalia had a lot of. So I think they use the example of like a soup can, that that would have been, you know, pretty difficult because of its weight for Natalia to have even grabbed with that gripper thing. Additionally, a typical goal for diastrophic dysplasia patients who are in physical and occupational therapy is to walk 100 to 200 feet without stopping. But Natalia's medical records show that she struggled to walk 10 to 20 feet without having to take a break. So it would have taken her several stints of stopping and starting to get to the bus stop, which Michael and later his lawyers would make such a big deal out of claiming the bus stop was less than a block away, easily within walking distance. They would say Natalia's not isolated. She's not alone. She can get on that bus. She can go anywhere she wants. There's all of these things that are close to her. It would not have been hard for her to get to that bus stop. I mean, maybe not hard for them, but for Natalia, it would have been very, very hard. Natalia would testify that when she lived in Westfield, in that Westfield apartment, she would walk to the library, which was only three blocks away, and it took her 30 minutes to walk that distance because she had to stop four to five times to rest, and a few times she'd even gotten lost because she was a child. Now we're going to get into some more details and specifics um, in a minute, but Michael and Christine Barnett would be charged with neglect in 2019, and this power couple would quickly turn on each other. But Michael went on trial first, and orthopedic surgeon Dr. Joseph Bellflower was a witness at this trial. Dr. Bellflower is also a real one, like a real rock star in this. Like I'm very impressed with this guy because um, he'd actually previously performed one of Natalia's two club foot surgeries. And the whole thing about this um, neglect charge when Michael Barnett would go on trial for the neglect charges is that it would eventually be decided by a Tippecanoe County Superior Judge that the prosecution was not going to be able to refer to Natalia as a child during court proceedings because of the fact that a judge previously had ruled her to be an adult legally. So even though there was plenty of evidence that she wasn't an adult biologically because a judge had ruled her to be an adult legally, the prosecution couldn't let the jury know that the Barnetts had basically neglected and abandoned a child. They had to talk about Natalia as if she was like an adult who still had disabilities, who had still been abandoned, but the jury would have to make a decision as to whether or not Michael and Christine Barnett were guilty of, you know, I guess, neglecting Natalia and knowing that she couldn't provide for herself or do things for herself as an adult, right? The jury would not know that Natalia was a child. Now, there's clips of a Zoom conference call type thing, um, you know, before the trial happened. And this call is Dr. Bellflower and then Michael's attorney, Terrence Kennard, Christine's attorney, Mark Nicholson, and then someone from the district attorney's office. And they're basically telling Dr. Bellflower, like, this is what you can and cannot say. You can't say she's a child. You can't refer to her as a child. And let me tell you, 
Okay, Dr. Bellflower did not come to play. I'm going to see if I can play the clip and show you what a rock star he is. But either way, I'll explain. Dr. Bellflower says that he treated Natalia in 2010. And at the time when he treated her, he was told that she was six years old. And Christine's lawyer, Mark Nicholson, who's very angry and aggressive, by the way, for absolutely no reason, he says to Dr. Bellflower, you know you can't refer to Natalia as a child in court. And Bellflower's like, what? Come again? Um, she was a child. When I saw her, her growth plates were still open. And x-rays don't lie. And medically and scientifically, that means that in 2010, Natalia was not an adult. She was a child based on her growth plates. And the lawyer, Mark Nicholson, is like, don't you say that. You can't say that. And Dr. Bellflower just claps back with like, well, what I'm hearing is you aren't interested in the truth. And Nicholson is triggered big time. Okay, like in my opinion, there's some childhood trauma simmering below the surface. He's like, you want the truth? You can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. But for real, though, I mean, he didn't really say that, but it was funny because Nicholson was like, don't you dare disrespect me. No one makes me bleed my own blood. Sorry, I'm done with my dramatic movie quotes. It just so happened that this attorney reminded me of someone from a dramatic movie, which I guess is appropriate since he's affiliated with the Barnetts. They can't have a basic lawyer. Their lawyers have to be extra AF. They have to be so over the top and so dramatic and so ludicrous. I am attorney Mark Nicholson for Christine Barnett. Jackie Starbuck, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney. Attorney Terrence Kennard, representing uh, Michael Barnett. Now, you have evaluated Natalia, is that correct? Uh, I did. I treated her back in 2010, I believe. You know that Natalia is not a child. When I saw her, her growth plates were open, so she was not an adult when I saw her. She had been legally declared an adult. Okay. Not at the time of treatment, just so we're clear. I my time of treatment, she was not legally an adult. She came in and I was told that she was six. It's not me that's saying it, doctor, with all due respect. It's the I court. That, but the, I well, sir, let me finish, please. Let me finish. It is the court order that gave her a date of birth. And the point I'm trying to get across to you is that when you testify and the prosecutor should tell you, there's not going to be any testimony of you trying to tell the jury that well, when I saw her, she was a child. What I'm telling you is, x-rays don't lie. Your growth plates are not open, sir. Once but, Doctor, you understand that we can't talk about that at trial, right? So I'm to refer to her as an adult? A, a person. So we're not really interested in the truth. What we're interested in is what was legally put out there. I don't appreciate you saying that we're not interested in the truth. <laughs> because I am interested in the truth. Okay. There's been a lot of lies that have been going on. on. We are not uh, going stop, stop. to argue. About I'm not arguing. What I'm telling him is he, he, will not, he will not disrespect me and say that I am not interested in the truth. You're not. Okay. You know, what I'm saying? Not. You know because he, he just said that well, we're not Mr. interested Mr. in the truth. Can we, can we get back to the Her point? birth date, doctor, is September 4th, 1989. So Dr. Bellflower, he was not backing down, and I love him for that because sometimes people will feel the pressure to go along with whatever crazy narrative is being spewed out. I mean, look at Dr. Andrew McLaren, right, Michael Barnett's primary care physician, um, which is funny because in this docu-series um, that did the ISP detective calls Dr. McLaren, and he's like, did you know that Natalia's not an adult, like you said in your affidavit. And Dr. McLaren is like, well, I thought she was. Like, I, you know, I just said what I thought. And um, the detective's like, the Barnetts are going to try to throw you under the bus, dude. Like, how do you feel about that? Like, how does that make you feel? And Dr. McLaren's like, not good. <laughs> so kind of funny. But anyway, Dr. Bellflower was like, not today, Satan. I'm going to tell you that I have a problem with this and that I'm not comfortable with this at all. During the trial, however, even though Dr. Bellflower was not allowed to say that Natalia was a child at the time the Barnetts abandoned her in that second floor Lafayette apartment, he was able to testify about her disability and her limitations. And he said that when he saw her in 2010 for the surgery on her foot, Natalia was mainly using a wheelchair to get around. And he also said that although it's not completely understood why, 
It's believed there may be a neurological component with diastrophic dysplasia patients that makes their club foot 25 to 30 percent more likely to come back even after surgery, and this would have made it even more difficult for Natalia to walk up the stairs of her apartment and to function inside of that apartment. So Indiana State Police Detective Brandon Davenport also testified claiming that he believes Natalia was in great danger of becoming a victim of human trafficking. Uh, You know, she looks like a child. She's on her own. It's not the best part of town. Um, You know, there's like rehab centers and halfway houses and things like that around the area. And if somebody like a predator was paying attention and seeing that Natalia was alone and seeing her like walk to the bus stop and seeing how vulnerable she was, it was a recipe for disaster. And I mean, all we have to do is look at this one interview from one of Natalia's neighbors to see what Detective Davenport might have been referring to and what kind of like people were around that general area. I spoke to Natalia one time and that was it. I never seen her with parents. You know, every time I seen her, she was 90% of the time she was by herself. Been in the neighborhood since 67. I've seen it go from bad to worse. And I've been in trouble before. So, you know, I messed up in life. I've been to prison. Just like I tell anybody, I've done sex offense. I messed up in life. I'm going to get my time, come back out, you know. So I, I watch everything because that's what prison taught me. Right. To be very observant of people, your surroundings, because you don't want to get caught up in that moment again mm-hmm. and have something else happen to you. So, you know, she's a little kid, you know, I kind of stay away from that. I mean, what kind of person does an interview with cameras and people asking you questions with no shirt on at all? Like none at all. Not even a tank top, not even a crop top, nothing at all. And the way he talks about being to prison for sex crimes and how he says he like watches everything because prison taught him that and he has to keep himself in check basically and how she was a little kid. So he kind of stayed away from that. Like were your sex crimes against kids? Is that why you felt you had to stay away from that? Was Natalia living right next to a registered sex offender? I mean, the Barnetts had literally no care for her safety. And in fact, many people believe and theorize that they left Natalia in this area, almost hoping that something would happen to her and fix their problem. In fact, according to Michael Barnett, and what he would later tell Detective Davenport from the ISP, the reason Christine chose this area of Lafayette was because she said the people who lived there were a bunch of rednecks that wouldn't care to get involved in Natalia's life. She's like, oh, we got to get her away from Westfield where people are like, you know, caring about others and we got to put her in Lafayette where like they're just a bunch of rednecks in this area nobody cares about other people which is like the most ridiculous generalization to make and then um, in 2013 the Perimeter Institute in Ontario Canada wanted Jacob Barnett the Barnett's son to go to school there and get his master's degree because remember he's like a child prodigy so Christine and Michael took their three sons packed up their shit put everything that they couldn't bring with them online to sell, and then they left the literal country. And they left Natalia completely alone. Throughout the four-year period that Natalia lived in Lafayette, the Barnetts reportedly made no attempt to contact her. Kira Weaver, Natalia's neighbor, said that one day Natalia came over and asked if she could use the phone to call her parents because she didn't have any food and they had to, you know, give her money for food. So Kira handed her the phone, but she said Natalia just held the phone and looked at it. She didn't know what number to call. She didn't know how to get in touch with the Barnetts. They'd literally abandoned her and cut all contact with her. And before they'd left, the Barnetts had filled out paperwork for Natalia to get Social Security and disability benefits. But that was only $700 every two weeks. And that money wasn't even going directly to Natalia, as we'll soon find out. It was going to Michael. And then he would, like, pay her electric bill and pay her rent. Or he would pay... That He said they paid themselves back. He and Christine paid themselves back for her rent. So they said that they put down a whole year's worth of rent. So when they got her Social Security and disability benefits, they would pay themselves back for the rent and then, you know, pay her bills and stuff and maybe put money. I don't even think they were giving her money because she had a food stamp card. So I don't think she actually had access to, like, physical money that she could buy things that she needed. Now, when Natalia realized that she didn't even know who to call, she kind of like helplessly handed the phone back to Kira and then said, you know, I'm really hungry. Like, could I just have a sandwich? It's just 
so heartbreaking, truly. And during the docu-series, we also see a message exchange between Michael and Christine Barnett, which appears to be happening over Facebook on July 16th, 2013. And Michael tells Christine, quote, I literally just got chewed out by the new Natalia apartment people. You never gave me the electricity info. She's been without power for three days. Stop trying to control how she interacts with others. It does not work and always causes issues. End quote. And Christine responded, quote, give her the food card and wipe out her contact list and clear out her stuff so she doesn't go to Hamilton County and call everyone. End quote. Michael wrote back, quote, I'll wipe the contact list. But if you think she doesn't have those numbers memorized, you're crazy. End quote. Christine then said, quote, I will call the apartment tomorrow for Natalia. End quote. And Michael said, quote, and I will sit inside with a shotgun. Dot, dot, dot. Smiley face emoji. End quote. Don't really know what that means. Literally don't really know what that means. But Michael also likes to talk about guns a lot and, like, having guns and, like, shooting guns. So um, do that with as you may. I don't know. Like, I literally don't know what he means. He's going to sit inside with a shotgun. Why? To make sure that Natalia doesn't say anything she shouldn't. To make sure that she doesn't do anything she – what are you talking about? What are you talking about, Michael? Please explain yourself. So anyways, the Barnetts, they ended up taking Natalia's cell phone. So, like, they didn't give her a cell phone in that apartment. There was no landline in that apartment. And then they got in trouble for it, I guess. They got called out for her not having a phone. So they gave her the phone back. But before they did, they wiped her contact list so she couldn't call anyone, which is what abusers do. They isolate their victims from people that could help them. Now, there were periods in Lafayette, in that apartment, where Natalia just didn't have food or electricity. She was 9 years old. She was 10 years old. She was completely freaking alone and at the mercy of any nefarious person who would find her. Really at the mercy of of anything, right? She could have just had an accident. She could have fallen down the stairs. She could have cracked her head open in the bathtub, and she wouldn't have even been able to call anyone for help. And then, you know, if she even wanted to get a neighbor to help her, she would have had to have, if she was injured, find a way to get down the stairs and and get someone. Like, it's crazy to think that – that this was, like, something that really happened. I also read a portion of Detective Davenport's testimony where he claimed that in 2012, before the Barnetts put Natalia in that Lafayette apartment, Natalia had been hospitalized, um, and when she was discharged by the hospital, no one came to pick her up. So the hospital called the Barnetts repeatedly, and they were like, hey, can you come and get Natalia? But according to Michael, Christine said, quote, absolutely not, I will not pick her up, you will not be picking her up. End quote. Allegedly, Christine told the hospital that Natalia could walk home, but obviously the hospital could not let her do this because Natalia was a child and she was unable to take care of herself. So it seems like right after they changed her age, they tried to almost like dump her at this hospital and then just leave her there and kind of like, well, she's an adult and she's not our problem and she's your problem. So do whatever you want with her. Now, this article on PurdueExponent.org says, quote, The prosecution went on to say that neither Michael nor Christine picked Natalia up from the hospital. She was later released to a halfway house. A halfway house is an institute devoted to people with criminal backgrounds, psychiatric problems, or drug abuse problems to reintegrate them into society. The prosecution alleged that Natalia was left in the halfway house for three days before the Barnetts picked her up. Christine demanded that Michael do so because she would, quote, not have her midget daughter die of an overdose. Davenport recalled, end quote. So Davenport testified that the concern was not for Natalia's well-being, but for how her death in a halfway house would reflect poorly on Christine Barnett. Natalia had been in Lafayette for about a year, and she'd started attending classes at the Lara GED Center. But after doing that for roughly a month, Natalia vanished. She didn't return to her apartment. She stopped going to classes. And when the people at the GED Center called Michael Barnett to report this, Michael claimed that he and Christine were so worried about Natalia that they began freaking out and calling around trying to figure out where Natalia was. But then a couple of days later, the GED Center called Michael back and said, hey, don't worry about it. We found her. She's with this couple, Cynthia and Antoine Mann. Now, according to Natalia, after a year of living alone in Lafayette and two years of living alone in general, she still didn't know how to cook or use a clothes washer. She was living on ramen, um, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, the occasional pizza. Her limited use of her hands and arms meant it was difficult to even open canned food or to wash herself. And her deformed hips, legs, knees, and feet had already caused her to fall more than once getting out of the bathtub. 
Natalia was tired, she was despondent, abandoned, and one day she was hobbling down the street outside of her apartment, but she had to stop a few houses down to rest, and that's when the woman who lived in that house that she was resting outside of came out and started talking to Natalia. Natalia thought that she was going to be yelled at or told to get away, like had happened so many times before. But instead, she said she was greeted with kindness by Cynthia Mann, who was devastated to find out that Natalia was living alone. And within a few days, Natalia had moved in with Cynthia, her husband Antoine, and their children. On the Dr. Phil show, Cynthia Mann said that at first she wasn't sure if she should believe Natalia's claims that she was living all alone, but it became obvious when Natalia brought Cynthia to her apartment. Quote, she took me over to her house, and it was definitely her apartment. She had a bed in there. She had a TV. She had boxed food in the freezer. I was like, I have a couple of kids at home. Come down. You can play with them and talk with us. So she came to our house and hung out down there, and she never left. End quote. By the time Natalia and the mans appeared on the Dr. Phil show, Natalia had been living with them for seven years, and Dr. Phil asked if they'd seen any of the disturbing behavior the Barnetts had accused Natalia of. Cynthia Mann said, quote, no, not at all. She would get into trouble just like any normal child would. She didn't display any kind of psychotic behavior. We've had three kids since she's been with us. She's been there for the delivery of one literally in the delivery room when her brother was born. She is amazing, end quote. And this is important because there were allegations that Natalia was very, like, inappropriate with children and, you know, especially boy children. And she would, like, almost be inappropriate with them and, like, sexually inappropriate with them. But the man's report, none of that. And the man's believed that the Barnetts wanted to get rid of Natalia so they would not have to be responsible for her medical bills. Quote, I think Christine felt like it was a burden. I think Christine felt like she wasn't going to be this role model mother that she was until this came out. I believe that there is something that she's hiding that she didn't want to get out. Because when we got her, we got a call from Christine and she said, take her to a psychiatric facility and get her evaluated because she's crazy. Don't believe a word she has to say. End quote. That's what Cynthia Mann said Christine told her about Natalia. And Cynthia Mann also said that the way Christine talked to Natalia, the way she screamed at Natalia over the phone, Cynthia felt that if Christine had been there in person, she would have hurt Natalia. And according to reports, it does look like that is exactly what Christine did when Natalia was in her custody. Hurt her a lot, but we're going to get there. During the docu-series, Michael Barnett has the balls, the audacity, and the piss and vinegar inside of his lumpy little head to actually try and convince us, the intelligent general public, that it was the mans who were the villains in this situation. They were the predatory ones. He tried to make it seem like the only people in Natalia's life who actually treated her with love and kindness and didn't make her feel like the worst thing that ever happened to them, they were the problem. They were using her for her social security money and food stamps. But really, I think Michael was just pissed that the social security money wasn't going into his pocket anymore. During the docuseries, Michael says that the mans used Natalia's food card with $500 on it and then, quote, a week later, I get notified by mail that Natalia's social security payments, which is going to me, I was paying ourselves back for the rent and I was paying her gas bill and her electric bill, are no longer going to me. Within two weeks of meeting her, Cynthia took Natalia to the social security office and Natalia signed over her social security money to her. They're subletting the apartment against the lease's rules. The mans were making money off of Natalia's apartment that we paid for in advance. She was evicted. There was nothing we could do. End quote. So, yeah, he's saying, like, oh, why are the mans taking her Social Security money and her food stamps? Because she's living with them. Okay? Because she's living with them. So why wouldn't they? They're taking care of her like you never did. Why Why would you still be getting that money? Why? Maybe it's because Michael was hard up for money at that point. Because in February of 2014, Michael Barnett filed for divorce from his wife, Christine, something that he claims he finally got the courage to do after years of pain and abuse. Christine and the three boys stayed in Canada, and Michael moved back to Indiana. And obviously, because it's the Barnetts, this can't be a run-of-the-mill divorce. It has to be contentious and dramatic and involve explicit text conversations and sexy pictures, infidelity, the works, manipulation, like all this crazy stuff. Michael didn't seem to say anything negative about Christine, though, until he was charged with the neglect of Natalia in 2019. And then at that point, he went ham. He spilled all the Christine tea. He put everything that had ever happened squarely on Christine's shoulders. And Michael said that Christine always had to be in control, and she used sex to control and manipulate him and others. 
affairs. Basically, he said that Christine would withhold sex from him and she would tell him that he was gross and she didn't want to touch him unless she wanted something from him, of course. But this neglect in his marriage made him turn to porn, which he then became addicted to because he says porn doesn't reject you. Porn doesn't tell you that you're ugly. <laughs> Ugh. It would if it could. It would if it could, Michael. It doesn't have any choice in the matter. It it didn't give you consent to become addicted to it. If it could tell you that you were ugly and it could reject you, it would. After Michael left his family in Canada, he claims that Christine dangled sex in front of him like a carrot to get him to do what she wanted. And the docuseries does air all of this out. Very uncomfortably, in in my opinion. Um, I was like, damn, they really did Christine dirty here. Uh, Christine sent Michael some naughty pictures to tease him and to tempt him to fall in line and give her what she wanted, which, as she put in a message to Michael in February of 2014, quote, sex and fighting in court are kind of at odds. Trust me in court. File no contest and give me custody, end quote. And Michael did. He did exactly what she asked. And now I guess he hasn't even seen his two younger sons in years. They don't talk to him. They don't have anything to do with him. And Michael says he believes Christine brainwashed them to hate him. But yeah, the, this docuseries, man, they put out Christine's photos, her messages. I was like, damn, wow. Ooh. Very uncomfortable. Between 2014 and 2019, a number of law enforcement agencies began looking into Natalia's case. But since Natalia had left no forwarding address, it took a little bit for her to be tracked down. In September of 2014, the Tippecanoe County Sheriff's Office found Natalia, which brought her to the attention of the Indiana State Police. And it all came to a head in 2019 when Detective Brandon Davenport of the ISP started trying to figure out how Natalia had, you know, began her life in the Ukraine, but ended up in Tippecanoe County in Indiana. In September of 2019, Davenport paid a visit to Michael Barnett. And I get so much pleasure hearing Michael nearly lose control of his bowels when he finds out that a police officer is standing on his front steps, finally asking questions about the young child that he and his wife neglected, abused, and abandoned. Is there a quiet place we can access up? Is that okay? Dude, I couldn't stand it. I was dying when Detective Davenport's like, oh, um, I'm not arresting you today. And Michael's like, huh, can we drop the word today? All this like nervous laughter, nervous laughter. Oh, shit, I'm so screwed. Like, oh, my God, it was so, so satisfying. Michael's so nervous, anxious, desperate in that moment, and it's delicious. And it's not even an ounce of what Natalia felt and went through in all those years where she was abused and neglected and made to feel shame. It's not even an ounce of what Natalia had to go through living with Michael and his harpy wife and having to look at their stupid faces and hear their stupid voices every day. So Detective Davenport, the real MVP, talks to Michael on September 5th, 2019, and he gets Michael to admit that on that date, he believed Natalia was 22 years old. So in 2019, Michael said that Natalia was 22 years old at that moment, which means he knew that when she was left alone in an apartment in 2012, Natalia was a minor, and he admitted this to the police, and I really hope that they let me play a clip of this. Be honest with me. Yes, sir. What happened? How old <laughs> do you think Natalia really is? Right now, the second today? Yeah. If I had to put money on it, 2022. He admitted it. So, yeah, if Michael thought that she was 22 in 2019, it would mean that in 2012 she would be like 16, and I mean, she wasn't, right? She wasn't 16. Uh, when, when she was living in that Westfield apartment, she was eight or nine. And Michael knew that, allegedly, in my opinion. He was still trying to lie and cover and make it seem like not as bad. Like, he didn't want to say, like, oh, yeah, I knew she was eight or nine at that time. So 16 sounds better. But I guess the math wasn't his strong subject or he wasn't familiar with the legal system enough to know that 16 is still a minor. You still can't abandon a 16-year-old and leave her in, like, an apartment to her own devices, that's still illegal, clown man. By September 12th of 2019, Michael and Christine Barnett were both charged with two counts of child neglect and like several other charges as well. And Michael called Detective Davenport and he was like, I've been hearing that I'm being charged with like the neglect of a child. Is that true? And Michael's probably thinking like, dude, I thought we agreed on the not arresting me thing. Like I made you drop the word today. I made you say that you weren't going to arrest me. And now 
it feels like I'm getting arrested. Great Scott, it cannot be. And Detective Davenport is super chill and like laid back about this. And you hear him on the docuseries, he's like very straightforward, but also casual. And he's like, Michael, you admitted that Natalia was not an adult when you left her in that apartment. And Michael was like, well, now what do I do? And Davenport was like, well, you can turn yourself in or you can wait for us to come get your ass. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? So Michael did end up turning himself in. He bonded out within the hour, but there's a video of him being all extra and dramatic in his jail cell. He's like pacing around, putting his head on his hands, pounding the walls with his fist. Like, dude, you were in there for an hour. Take a nap, man. Take a freaking nap. Meditate. You need it. Christine Barnett turned herself in the following day. They both lawyered up, and then they went on a media tour telling anyone who would listen that Natalia was a psychopath adult who had tried to kill them, and she was also legally an adult. So come at me, bro, basically. They were like, hmm, 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 we set everything up perfectly. Like, you can't do anything. And the Barnett's whole defense was that Natalia was not a child, legally. Therefore, they had not done anything wrong, legally, even though Michael Barnett had already admitted to Detective Davenport that he believed Natalia had been a minor in 2012. So in order to prove more that Natalia was a child, you know, more proof besides tons of doctors and dentists providing evidence to this fact, Detective Davenport and an investigator from the Tippecanoe County DA's office traveled to the Ukraine on December 13, 2019 to track down Natalia's biological mother, Anna Gava, and once they found her, they took a swab from her mouth to compare her DNA against Natalia's, and the DNA test came back, proving that Anna Gava was Natalia's biological mother. Here's what Anna Gava said in 2022 when she was interviewed by producers from the docuseries. Quote, I was born in Latvia in 1979 on April 20th. I have four kids, and then there's Natasha, Natalia. She was born on September 4th, 2003, at 625. She is my biological daughter. They showed her to me. The childbirth was difficult. When I regained consciousness after anesthesia the next day, the doctor came in and said, there's no sense taking her home. They said that she won't be able to walk at all, and she will be a very short stature. They said a surgery would cost $100,000, and since you don't have such finances— I already had Julia at that time. Natasha came after. So she brought me a sample of a waiver on the paper. I had to write five copies of it. I didn't initially want to leave her, but the doctor said there is nothing you can do for her. You are young, they said. You're 24 years old. Don't ruin your life. You will have other children. End quote. Anna says that she regrets listening to the doctors and she wishes she'd kept Natalia because all these years she's been thinking about her and wondering how she's been doing. Now we have evidence that Anna Gava is Natalia's biological mother. And we have proof that Anna was born in 1979 since some dumbass judge changed Natalia's birth year to 1989. That would have made Anna 10 years old when she gave birth, if Natalia's age was actually what the judge and the Barnett said it was. And I mean, I guess that's not impossible for someone to give birth at 10, but it seems, well, kind of unlikely, which means that it's far more likely that Natalia's birth year is actually 2003 like I've been saying all along. Now, let's talk about the allegations made by Michael and Jacob Barnett against Christine Barnett. Michael claims that Christine was abusive physically, verbally, emotionally, mentally, in all the ways. And he, Natalia, and the three boys... Michael and Christine's sons, were all abused by Christine. Michael said, quote, knowing what I know now, being able to see how I was manipulated, being able to see how my sons were manipulated after the divorce, the question is, do I think Christine could have manipulated Natalia? That's an easy question. The answer is yes. Christine could have manipulated Natalia, end quote. And I think we already know that because both Natalia and Michael have admitted and claimed that Christine coached Natalia on what to say if she was ever asked about her age. But there may also be some evidence of really bad physical abuse towards Natalia. Both Michael and Jacob claim that the relationship between Christine and Natalia was tense and hostile from very early on. And Christine firmly seemed to believe that Natalia was not who she said she was and that this person had infiltrated their family and everything that went wrong was Natalia's fault. They also both admitted or claimed that Christine would berate and punish Natalia every day for not telling her who she really was. And she would make Natalia stand with her nose pressed up against the wall for hours until she was ready to write down the names of people that she'd lived with and tell the truth about her identity. The Italian this morning is not cooperating with Christine. Very adversarial, very bunny heads, and honestly, God bless her, the Italian is probably the first person to stand up to Christine. You will write 
your sentences. But since you're being a big stinker pot and you're just fighting, 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 you're going to need to have time on the wall. Can I ask what's going on? You will stay there until you get to the table and write down the names of people you have been with. That girl stands there, goes to the wall from 10 a.m. to noon. Christine gets every lunch, gets Natalia's food, puts it right next to her. You can eat this when, boys and girls, when you sit your ass at the table and you write down the names of every person you've lived with and you tell me who you really are. My home, Christine, says that, yeah, she's been standing still, nose on the wall, for eight hours. And she ain't getting out of there until she writes down names. Michael, don't you say a word to her. Don't you help her. I have been dealing with this all day long. Don't you do anything except back up your life. Do you understand me? Yeah. Let's see. So, at this point in time, it's been eight hours. Natalia soiled herself. Natalia, according to Christine, soiled herself hours ago. And poor Christine, on purpose, just to spite me and make me upset. So, I sit on the couch over here, and Natalia's behind me in the kitchen, Christine's on the couch, and we're gonna enjoy our evening. We're gonna watch TV. We're enjoying our evening. You can join us. You can watch TV when you tell us who you are. Two in the morning comes. She has now defecated on herself. She hasn't Move. Every day I would come home. And best case scenario is Christina sitting on the couch, angry, and the tattoo's in her room. That is the best case scenario for the next two years. Because of Natalia's condition, it would be very painful for her to stand still and in one place for even short periods of time. But there she was, standing with her nose pressed to the wall for hours on end. And you can tell by the way she was reaching to rub her own back and shifting from side to side. She was probably in a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. I'm not her, I can't say for sure. But I know even I'd be feeling it if I was forced to stand like that. And so I'm sure that it was even worse for Natalia. And just in case anybody is wondering, that is abuse, plain and simple. And according to Michael and Jacob, that was not the only abuse happening in the household at the hands of the Barnett family. Michael says that Christine would, quote, beat the holy hell out of Natalia. And he mentions that he couldn't stop the abuse. And he felt the only thing he could do was record what was happening for posterity. But his statement's confusing because he claims Christine caught him recording and she lost it. And she screamed at him about, like, how could you betray me? And then she forced him to delete his entire phone in front of her. And he says he did this, but he kept the phone for the chance that one day someone might be able to retrieve the data off it. But in this series, they also show us a social media conversation between Michael and Christine in November of 2013, where Michael tells Christine, quote, I got one of you beating the holy freaking hell out of Natalia in the living room when you tried to beat the truth out of her. I get it. I know you're a good person and that's not like you, but it got out of hand. She deserved it, but still, end quote. Now, don't get it twisted here, okay? Michael Barnett isn't being a good person. He's not honestly trying to protect or defend Natalia because if he was, he would have grabbed his wife by the hair, pulled her crazy ass off of Natalia and literally protected Natalia with his own body, if that's what it took, like a real man would. He knew that one day this was all going to come back on them and if and when it did he knew he would have to be ready with proof that christine was more responsible and more culpable than he was he wanted to have evidence that she was the mastermind behind the whole operation and he was just following orders but he really wanted to do the right thing deep down inside and that's why he's sending these messages and that's why he's taking these videos but i don't understand if he's telling christine i've got a one of you doing this but now he's saying christine made him erase his phone which is it do you have the video or did she make you erase your phone? Because if you have the video, show us, right? That's your proof, show us. And if she made you erase your phone and you don't have the video, she would know you don't have the video and that you, you know, erased it. So what's the truth here? But Michael does do one good thing here. He gets Christine to admit to abusing Natalia when she answered this message saying, quote, whatever, she was very evil and you know it. She's a sociopath. How dare you compare yelling at me to flipping out on a criminal in my house, impersonating a three-year-old, if threatening and poisoning people and lying to get my husband to sleep in her room, end quote. Whew, okay. A lot just happened there in that, like, 30 seconds. In that message, there's a lot we need to unpack. First of all, it's very possible that this docu-series has removed 
all context of these messages, and they showed these two messages back to back as if there was nothing happening between them, but there could have been. And in fact, the way Christine responds, it seems there definitely was. Like there definitely was messages between these two messages that we see. Um, something else happened, you know, because she's like, how dare you compare me yelling or yelling at me to this, this and that. Like some other conversation happened. But is she admitting to beating Natalia here? Or is she admitting to doing something else, like yelling at Natalia? We don't know for sure, right? I'm trying to be fair. But secondly, Christine says in this message that Natalia was lying to get Michael to sleep in her room. And this is a big put on the brakes moment. Was Michael Barnett sleeping in Natalia's room? And if he did, was it Natalia asking him to? Or was he telling Christine that Natalia was asking him to? I'm not stating that anything happened here. But I am saying that this is a huge red flag and it needs to be looked into. A grown man should not be sleeping in the room of a little girl. And the fact that Christine was upset about it makes me feel like something else is going on. Natalia was so young at this time. And if there was some sort of sexual abuse happening, she may not remember due to the trauma of it all. She may have blocked it out or she may feel ashamed to admit it at this point. But something could have happened. Now, Michael claims he never touched Natalia. He never hurt her. But he did give us a dramatic reenactment of what Christine would do to Natalia when she was beating the holy hell out of her. What was the worst case scenario? I told the cops this anyway. I told the police this when they came to me three years ago to talk to me about Natalia. So if I'm open and honest and willing enough to tell police officers this. Oh, dude, just say it. I can do this. There were multiple times, three that I bore witness to, and I'm certain far more than that, that Christine beat the holy hell out of her. So one day I come home from work, and this is maybe early 2011. I can feel the tension in the air, Walking into the house, I see I see my wife. I, I, I'll, I'll be I'll be I'll try to be as accurate as I can. Get one of the guys to point the camera at the floor. I need I need right here, Rish. Oh my god. To get you to understand. Oh god. The beatings were similar to this. What is going on? Ow. I mean, this person is clearly unhinged. Michael Barnett is what I call a baby bitch boy, and that's my term, trademarked and everything. And it can refer to any male over the age of 21 who has no emotional regulation, who puts the responsibility for his emotional state and his problems on others, who doesn't take responsibility for anything, and who doesn't know the first thing about themselves and they never grew up. No one ever taught them how to be a man or how to take care of others. This is the person who, when something's wrong with them and you know they're feeling unhappy, everyone has to know it. Everyone in their general vicinity can feel it. And because they are in a bad mood or angry, they want everyone else to feel like shit as well. They're often narcissists. They're manipulative. They do a lot of gaslighting and whining. They will constantly attempt to make you feel inadequate as if you're not doing enough for them because deep down they understand that they don't deserve you and they feel inadequate and they want to make you feel small so you don't realize that you're worth more and that you deserve better. Now, evidence that Michael Barnett has earned his baby bitch boy title is the fact that he has allegedly witnessed the horrific beating of a six-year-old child more than once and instead of doing anything about it, he just paid really close attention so that he could talk about it and reenact it later. As I said before the clip, Michael claims that he never hurt Natalia himself, but Natalia told a different story during her interview with the Tippecanoe DA's office. Natalia said that Christina would, quote, whoop her, and then Christine would have the three boys whoop her, and Michael would whoop her too. From Natalia's viewpoint, she was beaten, abused, and humiliated by every single person in the Barnett family. And that brings us to Jacob Barnett, the child prodigy who at this time of the interview for the docuseries was living in his father's basement and he'd become a bit estranged from his mother, Christine. Now, Jacob could have been having issues with Christine, but that didn't mean that he doesn't still have these very real trauma bonds with his mother, like a 
Stockholm Syndrome type of situation. Victims of abuse, especially child victims whose neural pathways haven't completely formed yet, they often develop a strong sense of loyalty to their abuser, or they can develop a strong sense of loyalty to their abuser. This does not sound logical, but the response to a threat is not logical because fear activates a more primitive reptilian part of the brain, the amygdala, and the amygdala is responsible for ensuring survival and also responsible for fear chemicals that actually suppress the part of the brain that makes logical decisions. The amygdala is not thinking long-term. The amygdala is only thinking about immediate survival, and so a child or even an adult who's living in a constant state of abuse will be told by this primitive brain response, whatever's happening right now is not going to kill you. So all you have to do is just freeze, endure, and get through it, whatever it takes. And then you're going to be okay. you got to get through to the other side. Now, the more a person responds in this way by enduring, the more likely that this will become an automatic response when confronted with fear and abuse in the future, which is why you see this cycle of abuse happening where the victim will just get through it and then everything's okay until it's not again and then they'll just get through it again. Now, additionally, the main survival drive in our brains is to create attachment to others. And this goes back once again to, you know, prehistoric days when we had to watch each other's backs. And this can present a really difficult situation when the adult abuser uses both fear and love in their interactions with their victim. When an abuser hurts their victim, the trauma bond means that the victim's afraid, but also might want to seek out comfort from the very person who abused them. It's complex, it's tragic, it takes a lot of reprogramming and a lot of work to break that toxic cycle and to reprogram your brain in a more healthy way. I believe that Jacob, as a child, was a victim of his parents just as much as Natalia. Maybe not just as much, but in different ways. And in fact, I think they both developed these trauma bonds with Christine Barnett. Because even when Natalia was being interviewed and they were like, well, where did you want to live? Then the Barnett said you wanted to live alone. And Natalia said, no, I wanted to live with Christine. So it makes me really sad, honestly. Because remember, for a long time, it was just Christine and Jacob traveling the world, talking about his autism, talking about his, you know, brilliance, talking about her book. They were probably very close, I guess, in maybe too close, right? Even in this docuseries, so many years later, with the benefit of his genius, with the benefit of time and hindsight, Jacob Barnett is clearly still protecting his mother, even though I think it's evident that he's feeling very torn about it. He even says during this interview that he's protecting Christine and that his mother isn't 100% innocent, but he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, during his interview, the producer kept urging Jacob to be honest. And she's like, hey, you could exonerate an innocent little girl. Like, what are you afraid of? Are you worried your mother will go to prison? But Jacob doesn't fall for it because he's very on guard, very vigilant, which is, once again, another side effect of growing up with chaotic and inconsistent parents. And he says, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And he walks out of the interview, which is taking place in his room, which remembers in the basement of Michael Barnett's basement in Indiana. Jacob walks upstairs and he starts talking to his father about the interview. But he forgot that he still had his mic on and we can hear everything that he and Michael were saying. So I, uh, I told him about my last interaction with my mom, but yeah, I, I guess the, the moral thing that I've, I've been struggling with is if there's some like shred of hope that she can be redeemed, I don't think it's worth dragging her character down anymore. Oh, I, I've done that. I'm done. You didn't hear my conversation with them yesterday. Well, I told the full and complete truth. That's a nice way of saying I put two rounds in a shotgun and I fired. It's okay. I feel like I deserve the right to tell my story. Um, I did not tell them that. Uh, I didn't tell them about kicking the stairs. Well, kicking down the stairs, we said we're not going to say, right? Yeah. My plan with going in today was to not tell them that. And furthermore, I understand that there could be legal recourse to that. And then, you know, I'm not really looking forward to like being subpoenaed. Like, you can't be subpoenaed. You were my oh, okay. A a a child. Oh, huh? my microphone off. I am such an idiot. I really hope that they let me play that clip. But in case they don't and I find out in post that they don't let me play it, you know, because of like copyright or whatever, I'll explain what happened. Jacob's talking to Michael and he says, if there's a shred of hope that my mother can be redeemed, I don't want to tear apart her character anymore. And Michael interrupts him and says basically like, that ship has sailed. I told them everything yesterday. It was the equivalent of loading two rounds into a shotgun and and firing, which is a weird analogy. Once again, I don't understand, but okay, Michael. Michael says, I didn't tell them about kicking down the stairs. 
And Jacob was like, well, I thought we agreed we weren't going to talk about kicking down the stairs. My goal going into today was not to tell them about kicking down the stairs. And also, I understand there could be some legal implications, and I don't want to be subpoenaed. And then Michael reassures Jacob, like, don't worry. You were a minor at the time. You can't get into any legal trouble for whatever the hell kicking down the stairs means. Because neither of these men can say out loud, kicking Natalia down the stairs. So in order to protect their own frail egos, their own splintered self-worth, they almost have to talk in code kicking down stairs. Obviously, in my opinion, they're referring to Natalia being kicked down the stairs, but by who? I assume by Christine, but we're also going to find out that Christine had her sons do some horrible things to Natalia. So they could also be, you know, talking about Jacob or one of his brothers. I'm not sure. During Natalia's interview with the DA, she said that the three boys beat her. She said that Jacob would pick her up and just drop her. So there was obviously physical abuse happening towards Natalia at the hands of of the three Barnett boys, we just don't know the extent of it. But clearly, Natalia got kicked down the stairs, and they just didn't want to talk about it, and they were using this weird, like, kick down the stairs, kick down. Natalia got kicked down the stairs. Why else would they be talking about it all secretively? Now, Jacob finds out that his mic's on, and he's like, oh, shit, I made a mistake. I'm so dumb. He says it very, like, deadpan, you know. Um, but then he does return to complete the rest of his interview, and he seems kind of sheepish because I'm sure he knows that the producers and everyone on the set heard everything that he said, and he seems more open to discussing things that had previously made him feel uncomfortable and maybe previously he didn't feel like disclosing. He starts by saying that one of Natalia's problematic behaviors was that she would urinate in places that she shouldn't, like on blankets or on furniture, and he said this would happen frequently. Now, if this is true, it doesn't necessarily mean that Natalia was trying to be a pest or harass Jacob or the other Barnetts. Natalia's behavior, if it was true that she was urinating in you know, inappropriate places, it's obviously a sign of something deeper. When a child deliberately urinates where they shouldn't, it might be attention-seeking behavior. It could also be defiance associated with ODD or conduct disorder. But most of the time, however, this is not done on purpose. And it could also be something called unoresis, which is a pattern of urinating in inappropriate places, such as in bed or into clothes. Most of the time, episodes are involuntary. And it's estimated that 5 to 10% of 5-year-olds experience it. And this usually lasts from the age of 5 to the age of 10. If Natalia wasn't doing it on purpose, it could have also been connected to her health condition in some way. Or maybe it's because Christine made Natalia stand for, you know, 15 hours with her face against a wall. Either way, Christine apparently made her three sons feel that Natalia was doing this to them on purpose, to torture them, to mess with them. And Christine told Jacob that the way to get back at Natalia was by urinating in her bed that she would then be expected to sleep in. Like, they wouldn't even tell Natalia that they'd urinated in her bed. They would just let her find out when she went to bed, and then they wouldn't, like, help her with anything, like, by changing her sheets and stuff. So Christine told Jacob that um, she'd been given this solution from a therapist, and the therapist told Christine that the act of Jacob urinating on Natalia's bed would be therapeutic. That's obviously not real. No therapist told Christine this. That would be ridiculous. That person should lose their license. But no, no, no therapist told Christine this. She made it up. So Jacob's clearly feeling very emotional about this still. And he claims to feel horrible about it to this day. It's one of those things he says that keeps him up at night and he feels like a Nazi just following orders. And you can tell he's, like, really disturbed by it. He said, quote, She had pink blankets. The vivid part is just basically the action. I remember feeling anger while I was doing it, experiencing a thought like, this will show her, end quote. Jacob was 12 years old when Christine instructed him to do this. Now, for time purposes, I will just explain what happened when Michael Barnett went to court. As I said, in September of 2019, both Michael and Christine Barnett were charged with a lot of things. Neglect of a dependent. Neglect of a dependent causing bodily injury. Neglect of a dependent causing serious bodily injury. Endangering a dependent's life. Abandoning or cruelly confining a dependent. And conspiracy to neglect a dependent. These would end up being very difficult charges to prove. Considering that at the time Natalia was abandoned, her legal age was 23, even though her actual and biological age was nine. In February of 2022, the court ruled that any charges that were based on Natalia's age could not be considered. So those were dropped. And then four charges of neglect of a dependent were dismissed due to statute of limitations running out. The Tippecanoe County DA's office ultimately decided that they would continue to pursue the charges that remained, which were basically just the neglect charges based on Natalia's disability. So not neglect of a child, but neglect of a person with a disability. And in October of 2022, Michael Barnett's trial began. And during the trial, like I said, the jury was not allowed to know what Natalia's actual age was. So within two hours of deliberating, 
They came back and found Michael Barnett not guilty. It's a story that captured the world's attention. A girl named Natalia claiming that her adoptive parents here in Indiana abandoned her in an apartment in Lafayette. She took her story to Dr. Phil, and in time, both parents were charged with neglect. Part of the issue was whether or not she was a minor or if she was an adult. Now, a jury found that the father, Michael Barnett, was not guilty. That verdict came down just in recent weeks. And today, and only on 13, Barnett talks since the verdict, and he shares his feelings about Natalia today. Um, As an adoptive father, did you ever love her? Yes, absolutely I did. And do you love her now? <sighs> no. So my question is this. If she, if you thought she was one age, but she turned out to be the other, but you loved her, mm -hmm. then why did her age matter? If I think my son is 14, but I later find out he's 24, yeah. he's still my son and Absolutely, I still love him. Absolutely, positively, you still do, but... If that was the one and only little breadcrumb or nugget, absolutely positively. But when you realize that just simply the age being different or incorrect is just the tip of the iceberg, but it ain't the age that would cause somebody to lose love with somebody, as you so eloquently said, that's not why I would say I don't love her today. It's been 10 years since we were together and there was a lot of things that again, unfortunately due to the gag order I can't talk about that would have caused feelings to change. Christine Barnett's trial had been scheduled for April of 2023 and Michael was going to be testifying against her, but in March of 2023, her charges were all dropped with the court citing insufficient evidence. Like, you didn't even have a trial. Isn't that when you should figure out if the evidence is insufficient or not? Unbelievable, unbelievable. What a miscarriage of justice. And some jury members from Michael's case have since come forward and called his trial a miscarriage of justice. Jane Parker, the jury forewoman, has claimed that even before they gave their verdict, she and the rest of the jury were struggling with the constraints the judge had put on them. She said, quote, during the trial, there's tons of questions that never really got answered. As we started the deliberation process, 100% of the jurors, 100%, definitely believed that Michael Barnett was guilty of abandoning her. But because the judge was very, very clear on what we had to follow, people were just like, ugh, we have to not guilty. Ugh. And that was the tone of the room. Oh, my God. He's going to be not guilty. You know, this sucks. End quote. Jane Parker said that after the trial, she saw the Dr. Phil episode that featured Natalia's case and discovered that Natalia was claiming to have been nine when the Barnetts abandoned her. Jane Parker said, quote, if that's true and we weren't given that information, that seems like a huge miscarriage of justice. We felt that Michael Barnett had really gotten away with abandoning and neglecting his child, and none of us felt good about that, end quote. Here's a little clip of Michael from the ending credits of the final episode where he shows his true colors. That's all right, you're, you're not getting the crying version. If you want the crying version, I'll bust that one out. So clearly, this dude was just faking it and acting the entire time, which I think was pretty obvious to me because he's a really bad actor and he has no soul and he is fake. Everything he does, even when he's trying to seem like the most sincere, is when he seems the most fake. And he doesn't feel bad at all for what he did or what he continues to do. On June 1st, 2023, the day after the finale of The Curious Case of Natalia Grace aired, the Investigation Discovery Network announced a follow-up to the series, which would be titled The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, Natalia Speaks. So it's going to be Natalia's side. This sequel, which is scheduled to air this summer, will provide us with Natalia's narrative, her side of the story that was very sadly absent during these first six episodes. ID says, quote, after years of being cloaked under a gag order due to the subsequent legal proceedings around the 2019 arrest of her adoptive parents, Natalia has been unable to tell her story until now, end quote. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing those episodes. I also read that Hulu is currently developing a scripted version of Natalia's story, starring uh, Ellen Pompeo of Grey's Anatomy as Christine Barnett, which is way more than Christine Barnett deserves, in my opinion. Christine does not deserve to be represented by Meredith Grey. This is literally just going to give Christine such an ego complex, like even more of an ego complex, like even more of like a um, false self-confidence. 
And, you know, we've talked about the fact that Christine Barnett did not take part in this docuseries, but she has since made a public statement on Facebook. And it is bizarre. I'll read it to you. Christine said, quote, I did go a bit quiet during the real-time documentary from just complete shock. Remember, I did not participate, and I am watching this with all the rest of you. When people are done with these allegations against me, I will respond. Also, anyone that knows me or knows my sons will know already what that response will be. If you are texting me out of nowhere with friend requests, no. Here's a breakdown of how I need to respond to each of you. One, I know you may have seen some compromising photos of me. No, I will not date you. We are not moving to Boca. This one is for the viewer in particular who will recognize himself. If ID is trying to make me a Kardashian, okay, fine, I'll also own that one too. But I'm not open to dating people who are watching the series. Do not try to pick me up. Do not try to phone me. Do not stop by. It's not going to happen. Unless, of course, you're George, Joe, or Elon, then okay, as previously discussed. And then there's like a like a weird emoji. The volume of male interest in me that has suddenly appeared is overwhelming. But the bottom line is, and listen to this one, Investigation Discovery, sex needs consent. Photos of me in sexually compromising positions from private conversations should have consent to be shared. I did not consent to sharing these, and I do not appreciate my family and friends being exposed to my private sex life. Honestly, I cannot describe my feelings about what has happened here even and the level of wrong this is. In regards to that, I will own my own private life. What I have to say further is, I have had sex. Anyone here who hasn't, go ahead and judge me. We all got here from having sex. I come from a long line of sex-having women and so do you. We are human beings and I am not ashamed of my private life. I am horrified about the way it is being revealed. I am currently being harassed as well but I am not ashamed. I get how it sells documentary series, but this was going too far, as with everything in this series. Two, other friend requests, please just PM me. I'm not cold accepting requests. Three, media requests, same as two. I'm looking forward to the truth being made public, even if this page is where it will probably have to come from. And I will tell the whole truth of it, and I will own what I need to own in this all. From my sex life to what kind of mom I am to how I initially from 10 years ago to now am handling all of this. Thank you. End quote. So Christine is referring to like one or two of these episodes where, yeah, a lot of talk about her sex life happened and, um, you know, she was allegedly contacting another little person, a man, who she was allegedly trying to hook up with Natalia, even though Natalia was a child and this little person, this man was an adult. And then I guess that this man and Christine... I guess, started, like, a sexual relationship over text and there was, like, explicit things happening and being said and whatever. Um, It's not important. It's not my business. The only thing I care about is the allegation that Christine tried to get this guy to be with Natalia romantically. Um, Other than that, I don't care about Christine's sex life. She could be intimate with an entire football team and it would not change my opinion of her, which is very low already. But apparently this was the most important thing that Christine had to comment on, right? Because she's a narcissist and she kind of is getting off on the fact that like all of these men are trying to contact her now, which I don't even know if I believe that. Um, Why would they? (laughs) But uh, I don't know if I believe it. But she seems to be like getting off on it. Like she finds it to give her more value that all of these men want to have sex with her. And she wants us to know that she has this value. And she wants us to know that these men are, like, interested in her. And she's making light of it. Like, unless you're George, Joe, or Elon. I don't even know who those person – I don't know who those people are. I suppose Elon would be Elon Musk. So she's saying that – who would Joe and George be? Joe Rogan? George? George who? George Soros? What are we talking about here? Like, so is she saying, like, only if you have money – You should contact her. What, like, does she know how bad she looks? Does she know how bad she looks? And it's not about you having sex, Christine. Nobody cares about that. That's not what you should be defending yourself against. You should be defending yourself against these other allegations. No one cares what you're doing in your sex life. Um, I did find it when I was watching the docuseries. I did find it startling to see that they kind of like exposed all her pictures and private messages and stuff. And I was like, is this even legal? And, you know, probably those things were already, um, exposed during court proceedings, which makes them public record, which then, yes, the docu-series can use them. Or I I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I did feel uncomfortable with it. I, I, I do. I'm trying to be fair. And I do understand Christine's point where like, that shouldn't have happened. We didn't need to see that stuff. Um, she's not like a murderer, you know, uh, she's still alive. And Oh, her kids are going to see this stuff. And like, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I do I feel bad for her? 
kind of, but I shouldn't because she's a bad person. So I just – it may be uncomfortable in general. But, um, yeah, Christine's a narcissist. Christine's a narcissist. And um, I don't think that she's focused on the right things here. And I think that she's making a big joke out of this. And I think she's loving the attention. As far as Natalia, uh, she's doing fine right now. She's still living with the mans. They seem to genuinely love her. They seem to genuinely want to protect her. And it seems that she's somewhere safe for the first time in maybe her whole life. And to find out more about what happened and what's happening, I guess we'll have to watch Natalia's side of the story when it drops. But for now, that's all I have for you. So is that enough evidence that Natalia was a child? <laughs> Are the people who don't believe it and are just not going to believe it and are going to die on this hill going to come come more to the middle now a little bit maybe? But that's all I have for you. So let me know what you think about this in the comment section. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. Hit like if you like the video. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Let me know how you're feeling. And, uh, you know, I, I really love hearing from you guys and I love talking to you guys in the comments. We have a lot of uh, great content coming up this month for July, so stay tuned for that. I've taken a lot of requests and I've been putting a lot of videos together. So we're going to have, you know, a very content-filled month in July. And I'm just really glad that you're all here with me. So until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. And I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. straight down and that river runs deep the mountains get steep and the voice is getting too loud oh this feelings are very it's looking like a cemetery they're going back from the grave calling out my name better say your hell mary well, you don't know how deep it goes until it's getting you slowly it's all you got to let it go I got blood.